All right, welcome, guys. Um, thanks that you joined the session today. Um, I'm glad to see a lot of people here that um, look at responsible metaverse and that are interested in this topic. Um, I will talk about some uh, principle, guiding principles about uh, you know responsible metaverse, um, you know how it pertains to tokenization, NFTs, and uh, speak a little bit about some some uh, some of the elements to you know evaluate and see. Um, on our journey to the metaverse going forward on the thinking that we have at Accenture. So as I said, my name is Björn Obermeier. I'm from Accenture, uh, Germany. Um, I think my blockchain journey started 2014 when I was still with Hewlett Packard. Um, somebody came to me saying, have you heard about this Bitcoin blockchain stuff? And I said, well, not really. Uh, I looked into it, got really intrigued. Um, eight years later, I'm still here. So it's a really interesting technology. And I'm very fortunate to be with Accenture um, to drive blockchain. Um, and as it pertains to the metaverse going forward, what we can do there. Um, before going into the topic, I would like to ask two questions to this audience. So how much do you trust the internet today to be private, secure, safe, inclusive, and accessible. So for those who think it is private, safe, secure, and accessible, please raise your hands. OK, as expected. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to ask another question. Um, will the metaverse be less trustworthy? than the internet today. Those who think it will be less trustworthy, raise your hands. Well, as expected, a couple, maybe, right? And I was interested to understand because you, know, you are here for a reason. Um, I mean, you have experience in the industry, you have experience with blockchain. Um, I think on a journey that probably most of you have done here, you solved so many challenges already you know, on blockchain on one building block for the metaverse, right? And I think, the people here in this room um, are the ones to save, you know, some of the challenges we see going forward towards the metaverse, right? In solving these challenges. Um, you're a global community, um, metaverse is a global thing, and I think it's a perfect match, right, going forward in order to apply these responsible guiding principles for a responsible metaverse, right? Um, and it's like as expected, um, I think, if, if you meet somebody saying, well, yeah, I know exactly what the metaverse is going to be, um, I doubt it. I think it's still in the make. And I think we have to talk about the metaverse um, right away. If we look at the evolution of the metaverse, right? And I think some of you might have seen the slide already by Tracy. It was presented and probably some other Accenture colleagues um, presented it before. But the journey on... Um, of the internet as we you know, had it like in the 90s uh, where there was the internet of data and there was sharing data and the, the sole purpose was to access that data um, from various uh, locations. Uh, moved into the 2000s, so the internet of people, um, social media, you know, connecting people together through you know, various tools and channels. And um, in 2010, we had the internet of things, you know, IoT devices to connect all stuff together um, to have you know, more um, connected, extended world, the extended digital world. And in the 2000s now, uh, 2020, sorry, um, we have the Internet of Place, where essentially we combine um, people together, um, you know, in a virtual and physical setting. So like the, what we do right here, you're here, you know, for the same purpose as the people online virtually. And I think these virtual worlds have specific rules and sets. Um, that we need to go on forward, need to appreciate. I think a lot of people flew in here and on your journey, probably you've looked, you know, before you went, you looked, okay, what are the entry rules into Ireland? Do I need a visa? Uh, what is the currency? Um, is there anything specific I need to do, right? Um, if you flew in from the US, maybe you had to, I don't know, do different things as, you know, when you flew in from within the U EU, like I did. And I think it's, it's, it's that principle that we see, you know, in many virtual worlds um, and like in physical worlds, these ground rules that we need to all, you know, um, zero in and apply on. 
that it's going to be important going forward with the metaverse. I think we need to apply as well, you know, when we speak about plays, um, about some general common rules like don't steal. I mean, I think that should be a pretty obvious reason, but in, in a digital world, I mean, we've seen, you know, very negative stuff as well that happened. I think these some, some of the ground rules for the virtual places as we go and enter into the metaverse that we need to look at. And the other dimension of the metaverse is the internet of, uh, of ownership, right? Um, digital assets, verifiable credentials, and um, those are, you know, things that are, that are owned by people, organizations, and interestingly as well, by things, right? And how do we combine the internet of place and internet of ownership, you know, as we go towards the metaverse in a responsible way? And that's something I would like to start uh, with now, because I think we have to start, you know, when we think about responsible metaverse, this is something we have to, you know, apply from the start by design and not somewhere later and start with the tech first. So we have a, um, developed a view on a responsible metaverse framework of what we think um, are good guiding principles. And I would like to go through them. And I think when specifically in the metaverse, when technology and experience and humans uh, all meet, you know, and if, you know, where it intertwines, there are some dimensions that you want to look at, you know, when it comes to responsibility. I would like to, you know, elaborate a little bit on uh, the trust dimensions, um, for instance, um, privacy. So as we, as we think about the metaverse and as we think about designing for a metaverse, um, specifically on the technology side, it's like we want to create something trustworthy that is um, maybe an implement privacy by design, right? We want to communicate as well to the audience, whoever the audience is, um, what are we going to do with their data, right? We want to be transparent about that. Um, we want to as well share how data is collected from an individual and how it's going to be used. And maybe you want to have the appropriate technologies in order to make sure um, an individual can trust um, um, what, what was agreed on. Um, we want to enable as well employees to have educated consent of what happened with that data. I think that's going to be more and more important. The more data that there is out, the more synthetic data that is out, you know, to trust and then have the means to understand is, is this something that I can verify, is that some information I can use in action. Um, as well, I think we need to collaborate with the various stakeholders as we define these systems, uh, being at organizations, being at employees, being at um, um, well, citizens. I think there's a multitude of, of stakeholders that need to you know, come together in order to, f to, to agree on the core principles for, for privacy and how data is uh, used in the metaverse. When it comes to resilience, I think we have to prioritize resilience because it's, it's gonna be a fundamental enabler to offer a seamless experience as we enter these virtual worlds and as we experience these and as we have persistency in, in these worlds. Uh, think as well, not about, uh, or think about, you know, when you scale these systems, not only about systems that we have already, but as well systems that probably we have in the future, you know, advanced networking, uh, networking edge computing, um, appreciate that there might be something else coming, uh, coming uh, in going forward. Uh, you know, as we enter the metaverse, there's so many devices and things that will play in concert, and uh, we want to have um, this in a, in, a, in a resilient way um, that we can assure scalability and interoperability, so we have the right experience. Then I would like to speak about uh, security briefly. Um, so we want to design for, obviously, security. Um, for now and appreciate future threats. It's all emerging technology that comes together um, that is posing new attack vectors. So um, it's going to be interesting as well to provide a lot of training of what these technologies can do to the employers and whoever is using that technology. Right? Um, I think the gentleman from a bank yesterday said there was still a lot of miscommunication or, mis, uh, or, or, or people were not trained up to understand what it really is. I think that's just proving the point that still education is king. Um, probably the same education as somebody referred to yesterday on the energy consumption of Bitcoin. I think we way past that, but still it pops up. So I think education again on security, how to use it, what not to do um, is, is very much important going forward 
when designing a responsible metaverse system specifically for enterprise usage. Um, then there's IPR protection, so intellectual property um, that we supposedly specifically on digital assets want to retain. Um, I think we need to empower um, employees um, to navigate all this complex IP, um, IPR landscape. It's going to be very complicated to understand specific ownership relationships as we you know, move through the metaverse, who is owning what specifically, when, where, what, which device. Uh, that's going to be probably uh, pretty complex and it's probably going to require some, some lawyers to understand maybe the ins and outs and the restriction and what not to do and maybe there are still missing standards um, that will have to be developed. But I think it's imperative to understand how do you navigate, how do you make sure that you do not willingly or un unwillingly infringe you know, any patents or, or any, any IP. Um, and at best probably you want to do it in a controlled um, way um, to have the right means in place to understand who is using what, maybe having actions for recourse in, pl in place as well that you can, you know, if you discovered something that you can uh, actually recourse that. Now what's interesting I think is the, um, are the human dimensions to the metaverse, right? Uh, I mean it should be kind of, you know, people centric, built around us and our needs and not necessarily around, you know, what is the technology and what can it do for us. But um, there is these about human dimensions that we want to appreciate. Um, for instance, the um, safe interactions. So we want to create an environment um, where employees feel trust and safety, right? Where the company code and the ethics um, that we all agree on um, is built in, right? Like, as I referred to before, um, stealing is probably a bad idea. I think that's a general concept on the planet that this is not cool. Um, and that can, of course, in a digital world, you know, pan out to how do you protect, pro, uh, protect um, digital assets? How do you secure IP? How do you secure documents? How do you secure um, personal data, biometric data, maybe as you go into the metaverse, as your avatars may represent you in a biometric fashion that somebody could steal your, your biometrics. Um, all things to probably think about um, as you design these worlds. Um, sustainability, uh, I think this presentation and the principles would not be complete if we haven't spoken about sustainability. And I'm not only want to talk about energy consumption, Bitcoin and, and you know all that, um, I think we understand. I'm pretty much looking forward to what's happening on Thursday with the merge. Um, I think that's one of the platforms, you know, going into the right direction and reducing energy consumption. But when I, when I speak about sustainability in this concept, I think we can leverage the innovation that we see from other technologies in the metaverse. You know, think about the XR world and the you know immersive learning, and how you can apply all these innovations and technologies to reduce our energy, um, energy consumption and carbon footprint by, you know, using the right technologies at the right time. Um, so there's so much cool stuff out there uh, that we haven't had, um, you know, a couple of years back. So we can use it in order to be more sustainable and mindful of how we use the technologies and how we use the energy that we have. Then um, well-being. So we want to center around the employees or people's well-being when we create these worlds, right? Um, in a world where you can be anonymous, pseudonymous, or known, unknown, uh, I think sometimes it's a platform for being bullied. Um, so we want to design environments where people feel safe, trusted, where people uh, can thrive personally and professionally and have the right tools um, and the right information um, so that they can actually use them. Um, nobody probably will use an, a system where you can trust what you see, where um, people are offensive because there is no means and there's no protection and guardrails in place that, that um, prohibit you know, bad behavior. On the flip side, maybe it's an, um, it might make sense to incentivize good behavior once you enter these worlds to, to set a you know, precedence so, so people follow um, you know, that, that good behavior and example. And then I think inclusion, diversity and accessibility. Um, 
is very important as well. So we want to employ um, design methodologies that caters for you know, inclusion that you can access um, and be authentically yourself when you enter a metaverse. Um, and I think in a digital form to be authentic requires a lot of technology to make that happen. Um, but it's, uh, I think, a, a very um, important point as well as the collaboration goes forward and as we collaborate um, way more going forward. So I think these are our, our thinking about the eight um, core principles of how to build a um, sustainable metaverse. And what I found interesting as well um, throughout the week, when you listen to the conversations here um, during Hyperledger, just the language alone, I've heard so many times, um, are you somebody from the private world or from the enterprise world? Um, so there's already a couple of worlds, right? And, and I mean, I think that's evidence that, you know, we, we all will move into the metaverse. Um, and again, I think this group is really geared up to change it or build it in a way that is really responsible. And I've heard as well, there's a lot of, um, uh, a lot of mentions about interoperability. How do you connect different ledgers? How do you, you know, keep things uh, on one network and you know, transport it to another? How do you combine that? And I think um, this alone um, is, is evidence for enough that you know, all of us here w will be, you know, play a crucial role in the metaverse. And hence, I think responsibility, how to, how to build it responsible is um, something where we have probably an obligation to do that. Um, and we have a chance to make it right from now with all that we've already learned and know. Um, I would like to switch gears a little bit to put it in perspective. Um, so I wanted to um, use an example to elaborate a little bit. So I wanted to talk about tokenization. Um, right now, I guess we're tokenizing everything, right? There's so many things that are tokenized here and there. And um, essentially tokenization is the, is the art of, of, of representing an asset in a digital form, most of the times on a ledger in form of a token, right? And um, what are the, um, the core elements of, of, of tokenization? Um, so there's the digital representation, um, then uh, I'll just talk about it. Then uh, it acts as a bearer instrument. Um, so meaning that the owner of the token, which is marked in that token, um, controls the ownership and can transfer the token um, where they want it to be. Then there's an authoritative source of truth um, because you can kind of um, backtrack um, and understand the ownership on the ledger smart contract, um, which is very, very important to understand um, if somebody claims something um, to, to verify that claim. And then there is the pro uh, programmability, so meaning that you can apply business code and business rules into, uh, into that token. Um, we see this all, all across the boards and we hear terms of right now NFTs, right? I think that's really hot currently. I think as well we need to differentiate and we need to be really mindful of what we mean when we think about NFTs, whether it be in the, uh, the ones that are, you know, social investments, um, two-dimensional RD NFTs, brand NFTs. I think we have NFTs ever since the dawn of Ethereum in 2014. I mean, it's essentially smart contracts, right? Um, recently, I think NFTs were really hyped um, for, you know, these use cases. But there's fungible tokens as well. It's just two classes. And um, I think it might make sense if you just talked about, I referred to about uh, as, as token economies and understand what we want to do with that token and what are the, the properties and the uh, possibilities. It might be a fungible token. It might be a non-fungible token. I think it's a, it's a nuanced discussion sometimes of what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. Um, but I think I just want to use that example. How can, we, how can we use these core principles to build enterprise systems if NFT is an answer? I'm not saying NFT is the answer, right? 
but how can we use these core principles to make sure if we use an NFT that it is um, well, trustworthy, um, there is privacy versus anonymity. I mean, there's a lot of trade-offs that we maybe want to look at, uh, but you want to look them at them from the start. Um, what are the client expectations that we do see um, in token economies, and they may apply for NFTs and fungible tokens? Um, essentially, um, there's, there's a lot of value in there, you know, to develop um, completely new offerings, new products, new services, new partnerships, stuff that you couldn't do before that you may be able to do now. Um, you can create new forms of uh, value. So there's, there's um, social capital um, in entertainment. I think that's very, uh, very big right now in sports. Um, I think NBA Top Shots is probably the example of um, using you know, NFTs for customer and fan interaction and you know, going completely new forms. But um, yeah, it's interesting. Um, IP access to information, um, controlling who sees what, when, how. Uh, especially um, when you have content creators, you can people you know get uh, content created, but share that content and you know get uh, you know new you know monetary system in place or to to get the benefits later as you send them send them around. Um, and you can embed like you know the rights to view own, send, um, receive. So there's a lot of things, rights, rights and obligations that you can embed. Um, you can improve customer relationships, um, as said, like you know, with MBA, um, you have direct customer interaction and engagement, things you, you haven't had before. And it drives long-term value as well. I think that's evident um, that we see that um, because you have a way closer customer interaction and, and you, you really tap into you know, value pools that you haven't tapped in before because you have this direct access. So what I would like to maybe ask or, or reflect about is, I thought a lot about, you know, are NFTs good? Do we need NFTs? Um, this is the best I could come up with. Um, you might have seen in my initial slides, um, I was doing solutioning and, and IT architecture. My default answer is it depends. Um, it's probably when we talk about NFTs or token economies, I think it's a yes, no, maybe question. Uh, I think it really depends on what is it that we want to do? Um, what are requirements like institutional custody? Do we need that? Um, can we, you know, can we use well-governed networks or less governed networks? Um, I think, you know, it's, it, it's a broad spectrum of questions that we have to ask when thinking about token economies, when thinking about fungible, non-fungible tokens, um, I would love to have a definite answer um, on using NFTs or not, but I think there's so many dimensions in there, um, specifically for an enterprise use, uh, making it responsible, that we need to, need to ask ourselves, <coughs> do we actually need an NFT? Um, if an NFT is poorly designed, isn't that contradicting a responsible metaverse? Um, so you really, really need to to think about you know, how you go about your NFT strategy and how you build NFT for enterprise. So um, as guidance, um, I think those are some of the elements when, uh, when customers are asking us, hey, I wanna have an NFT, when we see you know, others, how can I build an enterprise marketplace? How can I build primary, secondary, whatever? Um, there's a lot of questions and I think there's a lot of guidance that uh, can be provided. Some of the things are probably not new for you guys here uh, because there are questions that are, you know, probably in your day-to-day -day business. Uh, but still think about the security implications of, of the de decentralized platforms. Um, that power that is the underpinning technology layer of, um, of NFTs. Think about governed and less governed platforms. Um, I think that's very important um, going forward um, to be cognizant of what's the governance level of the underlying DLT blockchain platform and is this something that fits and, and, and fits my needs or is it defeating the purpose? Um, so be very mindful of, of that. Um, difference in consensus mechanisms, yeah, um, uh, if you have options, um, you could choose, I think. Um, Identity, uh, very broad topic. I think we cannot go in detail. 
but um, legal identity, um, how, how do you manage ver uh, verifiable credentials, how do you store them, who is actually attesting that a verifiable credential is what it, or that the identity is, is actually saying uh, you are you and who's doing that, how do you manage that, how you can how can you someone else let know that is you? Um, there's tools out there. Uh, there's, there's a lot of projects, there's a lot of focus. Uh, I think we heard it this morning um, from the identity woman and from others. Um, the EU has a lot of stuff right now, um, a lot of tenders, um, work is in progress. But I think to cl in the internet of ownership and with synthetic data um, that, that, that is there, I think understanding what, what data you can trust, what is integer and, and what is actionable, I think it's going to be you know, paramount um, um, under, or requires a lot of understanding so you can actually use that data. And it's going to be only more and more and more data. Um, privacy, I think there's a, there's a trade-off, um, you know, looking at you know, privacy versus anonymity, pseudonymity, depending on the use case, you may want to have an answer on that. And depending on what industry you're in, uh, maybe um, you have um, requirements um, that are against, or sorry, that doesn't do not allow you know decent levels of privacy um, because you need to report, uh, for instance. Um, biometric user data: um, the more um, sophisticated 3D avatars get in the metaverse, um, be aware that um, they may represent um, you know properties, features that are. Now in the metaverse and people can maybe steal your identity through that. Um, so maybe just be aware of that. Um, and I think custody of information and digital assets is something that receives a lot of focus, right? Um, I think Dave talked about it, Dave Treat in the keynote about you know, a wallet holding um, digital currency objects and verifiable credentials. Um, I think this is something that we need in order to have this persistent experience um, to move between and move safely between these virtual worlds. Custody will have different levels. Uh, there, will be, there will be a need for institutional custody. There will be maybe self-custody. So there's a lot of options out there. And I think it's a very interesting point to, that needs to be addressed early and needs to uh, receive the right attention. Um, social engineering attacks, I think, you know, Everything around that, um, people trying to steal, um, you know, your passphrase, your wallet. I think that's traditional security concerns um, that you probably can solve with education. Um, but still, I guess you, you see this every every day in the news: um, people's wallets got hacked, um, leaked, whatever. So the right level of security for these wallets um, uh, might be uh, opportune. Um, insurance of digital assets, I think that's an interesting point. Um, how, how do you ensure, you know, if something gets stolen, um, if you do it maybe in a less governed network, who would you actually sue? Um, it's an interesting question. Uh, maybe, you know, that requires some lawyers to talk through of, you know, what's possible, what's not possible. But as we enter all these, you know, multiple worlds and dimensions, I think um, you have to understand where could your digital assets travel, who do you do business with? Uh, who's your stakeholders? Um, can you press charges to someone in case something happens? Um, I think that's, um, that's an interesting dimension. Digital identity, I think I touched on this uh, already. Um, how do you prove someone is who he says he is? Um, how do you prevent identity theft um, that may go back to the institutional custody? Um, even things like how can you make sure you can share identities in case you need that? How can you back up? What happens if you lose your phone? Right? Um, how can you make sure you get your stuff back? Um, not easy. How can you share a credential with your wife, for instance, in case you want it? Um, that may be hard as well, depending on, on, on the technology used. And um, I think I touched on, on the intellectual property, right? Um, privacy, uh, piracy, plagiarism, um, the brand of digital assets and what's contained, uh, the infringement. I mean, copying a JPEG or copying something digital, nothing prevents you from doing that. Um, so if somebody says, um, I have an NFT, I own the NFT, there's digital art in there, nobody can copy it, uh, well, everybody can copy it. Um, it's easier than ever before. It's just that ownership um, that you can prove that or claim that you own this, um, that specific you know, private key, essentially. 
Um, the enforcement of smart contracts, I think that's an uh, oldie but goldie. Um, should they execute business logic or not? Should they only um, facilitate business logic? Um, should they be a safeguard of whatever you wanted to do? And I think it will, um, you need to be cognizant of the new levels of fraud that may happen uh, going forward. So you gotta know your customer, um, know your transactions. I think it's an interesting one um, to understand um, what happens to have the means of investigating actually, um, to do analysis and maybe as well um, you might need to do recourse, uh, which depending on the platform you may have or may not have. And then what I think personally is really interesting with the advancements in deep fakes, how do you trust an interaction in a metaverse? You know, when you do have your digital representation, deep, deep fakes got so good, sometimes it's really hard to tell. How do you navigate? What are your sources of trust? Is it a verifiable credential? Is it an attested identity? Um, if somebody's, if an avatar is giving you information, can you trust it or not? And um, how does it as well pertain to fake news, right? So these are some elements I think are worth to consider when designing or when entering the journey into the metaverse. Um, when entering into an enterprise marketplace, um, if you need that. Um, so there's a couple of considerations probably that you want to uh, look at. And um, actually I wanted to close off with uh, some thoughtful questions maybe on you know, some trust and ethical trade-offs. So how, you know, what's your answer on the organization? How will you meet the expectations about data privacy and security as well as you know, deriving the appropriate business value? Right, so what is the trade-off? What is your answer? How would you design uh, a responsible data and tokenization strategy uh, that balances, again, privacy and security needs? And as well, how do you robustly authenticate digital identity uh, while preserving um, probably the ease and use of access? I cannot provide answers to these questions for everyone here. I think everybody needs to think about themselves, you know, how your organization is doing it. But I would like just to you know, keep that in mind um, as, you, as you think about the session, as you go out. And um, I think we have five minutes for questions and answers, if there's any. There's a question. Is Accenture building anything in the metaverse? Uh, well, this, the simple and very honest answer is yes, of course. <laughs> we have a couple of our metaverse leaders actually in that room. <laughs> um, well, maybe Melanie, <laughs> if you if you wanted to answer that.
was more than a dozen of us here in the room, in the building <laughs> that helps just from a scale of a very small percentage of our team are engaged on site. But we're getting engagement. Um, yeah, and I would say our, for those that met Dan, I mean, go to market for us. I mean, our, you know, the, the number of skills in our business group is larger than the number of attendees at this conference. Oh, wow. Um, you know, the, uh, our aspirations are to grow that significantly. Um, It's early days yet, right? I mean, so you know, we, as an example, of kind of what we're doing is we, you know, we built, we used Metaverse virtual places for onboarding our employees. We're on track for 150,000 people who will spend the first day of exposure in what we call one of the central part our Metaverse onboarding centers, right? <coughs> XR only, right? But the things we want to do, this is why we lean in to try to activate the ecosystem here. Okay, I'll just give a simple example. You know, many of our employees, younger employees, have Xbox. Right, owned by Microsoft, and they buy virtual skins and clothing on their Xbox. We use the Microsoft Mesh platform on which we build our onboarding experience, also owned by Microsoft. Right, but they can't wear the skin they bought on their Xbox into work. Right, and so that identity, even within just the walls of Microsoft, is really hard challenge for them to solve. And so, you know, what we you know try to do is get value from the technology where it is today, but then advocate right for these standards for the portability. For these solutions that you know just a Microsoft could benefit from, but then you look outside of the you know the walls of that, right? And you can sort of see how the investments, the capabilities that Hyperledger has built and continues to build is what we think is going to be so essential to you know bringing you know bringing us forward to kind of enable the next set of experiences you know, for for work, but also for consumer and everything. And just because I still have Sunday members. Together, you know, your vendors, your partners, right, your supply chain, you know, to make decisions to triage a supply chain issue, kind of in an immersive space, right? So the idea, of, you know, bring your own data, and make decisions together, you know. So the use cases, you know, span quite large in terms of how I think we really want, you know, much of what these groups work on to be successful because then it enables us to actually work differently and make decisions differently, um, you know, which is I think where. The next, you know, the, pardon my expression of calling, calling what we do cloud, but right, as data moves to the cloud, right, you know, or you have the ability to choose what you share, right, what you bring with others, now how do you get together and act differently, work differently, make decisions differently, we think will be a, a, a very big deal. Can I hire? <laughs> <laughs> nice pluck. All right. Thank you, guys.